So what we want to do as the first interactive exercise uh, today is publishing um, your own data set. And uh, for this, um, we want to use Jin. If you want to try that, I'm going to send you the link to the code that we're executing in um, the chat. Whoops. That's, that's that actually copied everything that's on that slide. Here's the link. Um, oh, it's not the right link, sorry. Um, this one is the right link. And the service that I, I want to show you um, is, is Jin. If you go to Jin, jin.gnode.org, you will see this kind of landing page. It doesn't have the same feel to it as, for example, GitHub, but it is essentially GitHub. It's, uh, it has very similar underlying source code. Um, and if you want to code along, then I would ask you to um, make an account by registering, or if you already have account, um, signing in and checking that everything still works. The reason why I really want to use uh, Jin today um, is because it is by far the easiest way to publish any amount of large data. And I'm quite confident that if you want to publish data later, then this is the place um, that uh, is most attractive to you. Um, a couple of advantages are that we have this integration with the um, convenience command to automatically create a sibling. Uh, there is annex support on Jin that makes it easy to push all of your data without any additional configuration. It is also nice because the web interface uh, nicely previews annexed files. It even allows your, um, your, your consumers to go to that web interface and just click a download button on individual files in case they don't want to clone the entire data set. It has great support for open science practices. So Tina already mentioned it yesterday in her first question how important it is to actually you know, archive data, put them into a stable location that um, is, is reachable, it is permanent. And um, Jin has the uh, very nice feature, thanks to the people at the German Informatics Node and the University of Munich, um, to assign a DOI to your data set if you ask them to do it. There's an automated process where you can say, hey, I want to uh, get a DOI for this data set. And in that process, it also ensures that there's minimal metadata and a license attached to your data set. So it makes uh, a lot of open science uh, principles, a lot of the fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable principles that, um, uh, that, that are very, very relevant. Um, it makes it really easy to adhere to them. Jin supports private and public repositories, so you can actually use it as, as a like private backup. And I know a lot of people that that um, create data sets on Jin uh, push their data there, drop it locally to save the disk space, and then retrieve it from their personal little private Jin repository when they need it again. Um, it runs on European infrastructure. The servers are standing somewhere in Bavaria, and depending on your data protection officer. Um, this may be something that is attractive, uh, also depending on what kind of data you have. Like still don't put any DICOMs there. I would not recommend this. Um, sensitive data uh, should be on infrastructure that you fully control yourself. Um, and then uh, Jin is free. Uh, you can just have an account. You can just put data there. And it doesn't yet limit storage. So in uh, the many years that I've used it, Jin has never put a quota on file storage, which is really quite amazing. All right, um, here's a view on one of the published data sets with a you no know, DOI assigned to it. I have fond memories of that data set because the main author of this publication that this data here belongs to, he just emailed me very late one day, said, oh man, Adina, uh, we don't know each other, but I really need your help. I have a you know, study published in Nature. 
and now they want us to have published that data yesterday and it's 200 gigabytes and I don't know what to do. And then we um, had a 30 minute email exchange and in the end of those 30 minutes, he had all of his data published publicly as required by the journal. So that's, that's a really fond memory of mine. Um, I will uh, do the, the, the part of explaining um, uh, what, what needs to be done in order to publish data in, in, in interaction with Michael. Um, and uh, if you could give me a quick uh, idea on who of you is, 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 is coding along by um, just uh, writing your um, GIN account name into the chat in case you decide to register to code along. Uh, that would help us to uh, also prepare the next uh, exercise on, on remote collaboration. Um, so the very first thing that I would ask you to do is to go to gin.gino.org. I hope it's, uh, thanks to Michael for, for putting it in the chat and create a gin account there. And um, the next part um, is uh, creating an uh, SSH key and I'll, I'll wait two more minutes for everyone to finish, you know, setting up their accounts in case you want to. And then I'm going to hand over to, to Michael who's going to demonstrate how to create an SSH key in the Jupyter Hub. Um, and then I'm going to briefly explain a bit um, how SSH keys actually actually help you do the things that you want to do. Um, but uh, first of all, take your time to, to create the account. So and once you have you, your created account on Jin, you can go back to the Jupyter Hub that we already used yesterday. I will send the address in, in the chat. Um, and you can again open up a terminal uh, so that we can continue. And uh, I would um, now uh, hand over to you, Michal. So I'm going into my uh, Jupyter Hub and I am opening my terminal. Uh, and what I will want to do now is some configuration so that I'm able to access G from this remote computer I'm, I'm logged into. Uh, and before we do that, uh, perhaps we could uh, talk about a moment about authentication. So how to how do we uh, how can we prove to Jim that uh, it's us who want to do things. Uh, so the first way of uh, authenticating is the one that we are probably most familiar with. Uh, it is a password. So I'm giving it a password and I can click sign in and it lets me in. Passwords are uh, really good. Um, for things like uh, web browser access when I need to log into a service. So that's one way. The other way is a token. And tokens are very much like passwords and they are used in the same places as passwords uh, with two differences. First, they are usually not chosen, but instead they are given to us by a service. So they are computer generated, they are usually long and uh, not very easy to read. And the second more important thing is that tokens are scoped. So in this in this instance, the password lets me to the website and website and let, lets me do everything, but a token might let me only create repositories, but not remove them or let me access a single repository. And the goal for, for a token is to be given to some program for uh, more or less automatic access. Uh, instead of giving my password that uh, that has uh, has permissions to do everything, and the third uh, third way is by the means of SSH keys, and SSH keys are files that contain some piece of information. They are pairs of files. We're calling them pairs of keys. We usually call one of them public and one of them private uh, because uh, they are manufactured in such a way that the two fit together, but it's very hard and it's easy to prove that they are indeed 
you don't need the pair, but it's very hard to manufacture the private one knowing the public one. So you keep the you send the public key to the service and you keep the private key private on your own computer or on your server. And whenever uh, whenever the uh, program communicates, uh, so Git or Bitcloud, whenever they need to communicate with uh, Gini in this instance, they are able to prove that the keys match and you gain <laughs> without uh, without need without without the password. Uh, so in our materials, we have uh write down on on the keys and uh, we have the links to instructions that are published for, by github uh, i think these are these are pretty much the best out there they are step by step and they are set separately written down from mac windows and linux uh, so that uh, that's an important resource whenever you need to do this thing and we'll do this uh, step by step uh, right here, partially because we need to set up our uh, Jupyter Hub, partially because I think it's, if you haven't seen it before, it's uh, very much worth to go through the whole process because the uh, key authentication is used by Gene, by GitHub, by GitLab, and so on. And uh, in my experience, the first time when you're almost ready to go, but getting rejected because well, you don't have the key uh, it can be an obstacle the first time but then you set it up and forget you you ever needed to do this uh, so we need to generate the pair this pair of keys the public and private one and there's a program with ss keygen and there is a command that uh, that we need to so I'm copying in my terminal and I'm saying SSH keygen. Um, by the way, I can first uh, maybe check uh, if I have some keys. So they are stored, if I'm on uh, Linux, they are stored in .ssh directory in my home folder. Uh, I don't have these directories. So I don't, don't have these. Uh, keys at all. If you are working on your own, then you probably, and you're not on Linux, uh, you probably want to follow the uh, GitHub tutorials. But if you are on Jupyter Hub, then you can safely proceed to generating a new keeper. It's ssh keygen dash t add. Let me just add 25519. So this add 25519 is the name of an algorithm used to generate this key pair. Uh, it's pretty much standard today. And uh, dash c is a comment. And the comment will be my email address that I use to register for G. Uh, it asks me where do I want to save this file. I want to save it uh, exactly in the default uh, location. It asks me to enter the passphrase. So this is the passphrase to the key, not the password to the service, but the passphrase to the key. I could leave it blank for no passphrase, uh, but I am on a shared resource. So the administrator of the Jupyter lab, for example, so that's me in this case, Bettina. Uh, we could theoretically access the key, and uh, if we had the key, we would be able to communicate with your Gin account. So you can use additional protection and type a password. So whenever the key is going to be used, you need to use the pass password to unlock the key, and then the key will be used. So I'm typing in some passphrase. I'm repeating it again, and it has been generated. And it tells me your identification has been saved in, the, in this place. The public key has been saved in this place. The key fingerprint is. So this is uh, the identification. And this is a random art to represent some 
part can not be this slightly parallel. I use I wanted to look at it with my own eyes. Uh, let's see into the SSH directory. Now there's two two files. One is called dot pub and one it has nothing in it. Uh, and I think I can uh, preview this file so cat displays. Is it? Uh, it's it's S S H. Yeah. Thank you. So it is a sequence of characters, and the private key is a much longer sequence of characters. And as I said, crafted so that the two things match. Okay, now I can go to Gene web interface, and hope you you, you follow along and go to the set. In the settings, I have a section dedicated to SSH keys. As you can see, I already have a couple of keys added. Uh, my practice is to use one SSH key per, per one computer. Uh, this one, let's just delete it. This is an old one, I'm not using it. And here's a button, add key. Uh, this pops up uh, a link to the GitHub guide that I showed before, but this also adds, allows me to add a key. The name is something I will use to uh, use to identify it for myself, uh, and I will call it uh, data log workshop. The content uh, is. Uh, the content of that um, public public um, file. If you go to the one second, I lost my notes. Okay. So what I could do is I could display the. Uh, display the sorry. so what I could do is to display the file that uh, I sorry I I missed one step going back to my terminal there's one command you can copy it that checks if the SSH agent works. So the SSH agent is a program that works in the background uh, that uh, is handling these keys. It, it's giving them out as they are needed. Uh, and this, this answer agent PID means that the SSH agent is running in the background. Uh, and now I need to tell the SSH agent that I want them to handle that key I just generate. So this is ssh-add and the path to the key that was created. So if we use the default name, uh, it's the one that you can copy from the instructions. And as I told you, I gave it a passphrase. It's going to be used, so I need to use it. And now the ssh agent says the identity is set. So I've not only created the ssh keeper, but I've also registered it with the SSH agent so that it will be used whenever needed. Uh, so finally, we can go back to Gene and we can add it. Uh, there, we need the content of the uh, dot pub file, so the public key, and I can display it as I did, select it copy or open it in the, in the editor, select it, copy, uh, and be ready. Or I can stay in the terminal realm, pbcopy does exactly that. 
do the same thing as the control C usually does. So I'm copying the content of that. Uh, oh, we don't uh, we don't have the PD oh, copy. So sorry. Uh, my bad. Uh, so I'll use cut to display the file content. I'll select it. Control C, go to three node, control V. So it will look in the end like this. The name is what I give, gave it before. And there's a, the SSH at 25519 and the content of my key and my email address. Uh, best if it's the same email address as used with Jin. And I'm clicking add key. And it's uh, it's in my in my list here, and the identifier uh, is from here, uh, so that I can, for example, verify without looking at the key content, I can use the SSH agent, give me the uh, key fingerprint, and I can see that this, what I am, what I have on my computer matches what I have on Gini. So let me maybe stress what happened here. We gave our public key to uh, to Jin so that uh, Datalat or Git or Bit Annex will be able to talk with Jin without uh, exchanging passwords. Uh, so might you might want to delete this key from uh, from Jin after the workshop ends. That way you are controlling access to your account. And uh, one more thing important in this content is that uh, Jin requires you to use the uh, SSH key authentication method if you are going to send annex content. So if you're going to send quote unquote uh, big file content to Jin. So the procedure for GitHub is, uh, is the same except the windows and buttons look slightly different. Uh, you can upload the SSH key and it will uh, help you bypass the tokens in many, many places. Uh, so I am using SSH key with GitHub as my primary method. Uh, some people might still prefer tokens before they, because they are scoped, so they are be created for specific operations or specific, uh, specific repositories. But the short answer is yes. Yeah, to quickly hijack your screen sharing um, to um, display a screenshot of how it would look like for GitHub. Um, sorry about that. But if you, uh, and I would definitely recommend it doing it on GitHub, if you were to add uh, SSH key and you can, uh, you, you, can, you can add the same SSH key that you're using on other repository hosting services <coughs> also to GitHub. So if you're redoing all of these steps that you have done in the Jupyter Hub, on your local computer for your operating system, um, then you can use one and the same public key to use with Jin and GitHub um, or several different ones. That's completely okay as well. Uh, on GitHub, the URL is obviously a little bit different. Um, Lucas has already, uh, I, I think, um, you know, guided you to, to the right settings. So when you are on GitHub and you have uh, logged in into your account, then you can go to settings and then the SSH and GPG keys. And there as well, you are able to assign an arbitrary title to the SSH key that you're adding and add the contents beginning with the SSH protocol or um, algorithm identifier and ending with your email address into the field that is called key and then add that as an SSH key. And um, to also um, support uh, what Michaela said about the uh, you know, requirements for synchronizing contents with repositories over various types of protocols, um, it's a little bit confusing initially, uh, but you, you might have noticed that um, when you click on a clone this repository button, on uh, GitHub or on other repository hosting services that it gives you this convenient little box that lets you clone the URL. And there are 
several URLs that you can choose from. The difference between those URLs is typically the protocol that they use in order to communicate with the remote server that is uh, GitHub or Jim. And you can either use a HTTPS protocol that is an HTTPS uh, URL that, that looks like this. It more or less looks like a completely normal URL, HTTPS colon slash slash URL. And then it doesn't end with .de or .com, but it ends with .git. Um, or you use the uh, SSH URL, which has a slightly weird form. It has this git at, and then the repository hosting service gin or GitHub, um, followed by a colon, and then what looks like a path. Importantly, and Lucas has already hinted at it, uh, most repository hosting services are increasing security to prevent misuse. And while you can, for all of these repositories, clone rep uh, repository hosting services. You can you can clone repositories without any authentication. So you you can be if you if you go to a public Git repository, a public Gin repository, a uh, public um, GitHub repository, a public Gin repository, um, you don't need to have a user account. You can take the HTTPS URL and clone it to get access. But if you want to contribute anything, if you want to upload anything, then what uh, most repository hosting services um, definitely favor, if not enforce, is um, connection via SSH. So Jin requires SSH, GitHub does not require it, but SSH is far easier. So even though this practice of creating this weird gibberish password SSH key thing looks a little bit complex or weird, but um, it in the long run makes the authentication process with this repository hosting much, much smoother and easier. And once you have it set it up, once you have set it up, it's usually um, everything that needed to be done. There's, there's, it's a one one time action uh, that does not need to be uh, repeated and then you got no 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 need to input a password, no need to input a username. Um, okay. So uh, I guess um, with everyone set up, uh, we can perform um, what is called, or what, what sometimes can be called, creating um, a uh, repository on a remote uh, as a sibling um, in order to, for example, publish um, the data that you've uh, acquired. Um, and we're doing this for Jim, and I've shown you several ways of doing this uh, before. Um, and there are two ways in which you can uh, do this too. So the first route is by creating a repository with the web interface that Jin provides, and then adding that as a uh, repository by hand. And the second one is by creating a repository using uh, data led create sibling Jin. And I think we can we can easily um, demonstrate both of these. Um, Michael, by any chance, do you want to to present the first route, and I'm going to present the second one? Or yes, I, let's let's do it. Okay, I hope my screen is uh, legible now. Uh, if we are to go the traditional route uh, through the web interface. Uh, we're going back to Jin, and somewhere here should be a button create, and there's another plus button here that says a new repository. So I'm choosing either of those new repository. It opens a window with some basic information. Uh, the owner is me. In this case, the repository name. So. The repository will, on Jin will be a place for our data set to live. So I'll call it datalab-101 or datalab workshop or whatever. This will identify the repository. Then I can choose whether it's private or public, but Jin doesn't, uh, Jin assumes that at the beginning it will always be private and I can change it later. I can give it a title or a description. So 
case which is something that will be shown very prominently work. And one more thing, uh, Jin proposes uh, that it can create some uh, initial files for us, like a license file and a readme file. Uh, this is sometimes useful. It's good to have these files in the repository, but one important thing for today is that I am unchecking this checkbox initialized this repository in the selected files and template. So I want to, it to be completely empty when I create it. I want it to be empty because I don't want to start by needing to address a config that some files are on Jing but not on my computer. So give it a name, optional, give it a title and uh, uncheck this, uh, this checkbox that says initialize with selected files and hit a green button, create repository. When I'm here, I am getting, I am seeing that it is, it has no, I'm not seeing any files because it's empty and I am seeing some basic instructions how to interact with Git or with Jinkly client. But the most important thing for me here is this URL that identifies the repository. And I've gone the length of creating the SSH key so I can click this toggle and have Jin display the SSH address that I will be using to communicate. Uh, if I go back to dashboard, uh, I can see this uh, repository at the list of my repositories near the top. So this is one way. And should, should we? Shall we proceed to creating it from the command line? Right. So the uh, second route to go would be not by going to the Jin web interface and clicking the plus, but actually letting DataLed do the work um, in the background for you. And that is going to be done by using this create sibling Jin convenience command. Okay, so, so what one, one more thing I did not say is that with that URL, I would then copy it, go to my data set and to data lot siblings add, give it a name and then give it this URL. So having created it on Jing, I would then register it with my local data set so that it knows it has a sibling. Yeah, and it would be the very same process um, with uh, any other repository hosting service. Also with, for example, a GitHub repository. Um, it's just the only thing that you need to remember. So you, your data set can have multiple siblings. They can point to different places, um, but they each need to have a unique name else they will complain. So you will not be able to have two siblings under the same name. And the name is something that you give explicitly um, and in this case, here in the command, this name is Jin. If you then have another sibling on GitHub, you may want to call that sibling, for example, GitHub. Um, so in order to demonstrate the second um, command, data let create sibling Jin, I'm going to go back into the terminal and I'm going to go inside of the data set that I want to publish. And then I'm going to call the data let create sibling Jin command. Um, and in principle, the only thing that this command needs is the name that I want to have on my Jin account for this sibling. I think I already have a data like 101 data set there. So I'm just going to call it my data set so that it's going to be my Jin account uh, that's Atspa and then my data set. Um, what I can also say is um, what kind of name that sibling should have. Uh, if you use data let create sibling Jin, the default would actually be Jin, but just to be very explicit, I'm going to write it out. And uh, you can already, if you're coding along, you can you can stop this command right here. I need to uh, do a different thing to to also include the step on how to create uh, tokens. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm using to using the credential command. Uh, that is an addition to any create uh, sibling command 
that um, you can use in the case that you have, for example, multiple accounts on a different service. And with the credential command, um, you can, um, you can uh, point uh, data led uh, to a specific credential that you want to use. So what I'm doing now, because I already have registered my, my token, I'm going to talk about what that is in, in a minute, because I already have linked that uh, data led will be able to authenticate uh, uh, automatically, but I want to show you how you make data led authenticate. So I'm going to use this credential parameter, but you don't need it. Um, so the first time, so what DataLed now tries to do, it is tries to, to access Jin, uh, and it tries to do that with a credential that it doesn't yet have. It will be the very same thing for you because you have never connected that DataLed on the Jupyter Hub with your Jin account. So the message that I'm here receiving from DataLed from the command line is an access token is required for Jin.gmail.org. Um, visit this website to create a token. And a token is a way of um, access management that Michael has already uh, talked about. Um, it's a security check that is very useful um, uh, because it ensures that no application, uh, no, other, no other user is able to go to your repository on any repository hosting and go wild deleting or creating new repositories. So what an access token is, is a computer generated password. Um, typically it comes with a um, scope of things that uh, it um, access, that, that it gives access to such as uh, creating uh, or deleting repositories. And if I go to gin.gnod.org uh, user settings applications, um, I first need to log in because I haven't been yet. Then it will take me to my settings and I can then go and click the button, um, generate new token. You can see that I also uh, use Jin quite a bit. So I have a number of, of tokens already available that I have used to, um, to give access to various applications uh, to make um, changes to my Jin account. So if I generate a new token, I'm prompted to enter an arbitrary name. So I'm just going to call that um, RDM Curse Jupiter, but you can, you can take any other name of your choice. And if I generate that token, I get this computer generated string that I need to copy. Uh, in the case uh, of you wanting to keep that token, private um, for your private computer um, when you copy it make sure to also create uh, you know just a temporary file somewhere and put it there because um, once you close that page you will never be able to see that token again you can of course always regenerate one but in the case that you really want to keep that token um, uh, outside of the Jupyter hub make a copy of it uh, immediately. And what I do then, now that I have generated that token that will give an application such as data led access to my user account, um, I will control V it into this terminal. It will not show, so it's, this is because this is a token. If you paste anything, it will not show up in your terminal so that, you know, you don't accidentally expose secrets. Uh, I hope that has worked, but don't panic if you don't see anything. Don't, don't paste it twice. Um, just to enter after you've inclu uh, included it. And then DataLed is able to, you know, create the sibling in uh, your name under your user account. And it gives you here this, this address that uh, has been um, created. So if I, I can actually go to, to my user account and I have created this data set. Now it's the very same thing that uh, Michael has just uh, shown you. You, you get um, the very same outcome as if you would have created it with a little plus sign. But um, the neat thing is that you can now run uh, data led siblings to list all of the um, available uh, siblings. It is already registered under the name Jin under this URL. If you're running this, um, what will happen? You will see a little message that really asks you to uh, if you are sure to 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 connect, uh, because data led siblings will make an SSH request with your newly added 
SSH key to the GIN server. And whenever that happens for the first time, the system that you're on will make sure that you actually um, do want to connect to that new system. So if you see a message that asks you to, to um, print yes or fingerprint to anything, then just say yes. Uh, I can also say git remote v because the sibling is uh, uh, the same concept as a remote. I can also use git to query my siblings. Uh, and here's one thing I wanted to draw your attention to, and this is the difference in protocols that is uh, used in, in talking to Jin. So um, git makes this distinction of fetch and push URLs. It's a little of a technical detail, but a fetch URL is something which is where it is updated from. Uh, you might remember that I've told you that um, using the HTTPS protocol, you can get data sets uh, even without authentication. And that is made use of here. So whenever you update in Git's terms, that is called a fetch. It will use the HTTPS protocol. Whenever you push, so if you push your local updates, it will use an SSH URL. So we emphasize what fetch happened here. Uh, when I was doing things manually from the interface, I had to, to create a repository by clicking buttons, and then I would have to to data lab siblings add to register this sibling to reach my data set. Here, the create sibling gene created a, a, a repository on gene, and it also registered this sibling. Uh, you can see that you can see the in the, in the output that says configure sibling. Okay. So it did these two things for us. And here uh, we had a little interruption for setting up the token, uh, but just like with SSH keys, this is something we need to do once per computer usually. So any subsequent interactions with Jin could be just me doing data lab creates in Jin, blah, blah, blah. And things would happen without me having to establish new tokens. That token is already established in data lab knows about it so this is a very convenient way if you need to create several uh, several repositories or if you're creating multiple small data sets that you want to publish right away yeah and now that the sibling is set up and registered in your local data sets the only thing that's left to do is to actually publish your data set to that um, to that remote sibling, and the command to do that is data let push. Data let push by default will take everything that it can push to the remote location. It will figure that out automatically. If it is a location that can host both Git and Annex contents, it will push everything, um, and then you just supply it with the name that you have identified your sibling with. So the Jin repository is known as a sibling under the name Jin. So if I say data let push to Jin, it will perform all of the necessary transfers of the data and also update the repository with the Git history. And if I now refresh this um, view of my data set, uh, you can see that everything that I have done yesterday uh, in this data set is now published to Jin. It's not public because the data set by default is still private, but you can see that um, I have uh, this, this history of everything that was done, 16 commits. You know, I can, I can browse them and check what, what has been done. And uh, Jin has this neat little file browser for annex contents that uh, displays annex contents as a little preview for most common uh, file formats, uh, which is which is really handy. So if you point a collaborator that only wants to have one file and does not know about DataLet, they can also go here and simply click download uh, in order to uh, perform downloads of individual files. That's really quite neat. So also, correction uh, the data set we created with great sibling gene is actually public. Uh, but okay. this is something you can control. The ah, right. sibling gene has a plug. Uh, sorry. Dash dash private, I think. True. Sure. Use, but I think public is the default here. Yeah. But the private true. is the default uh, when going through the web interface. But these are just defaults. You can control it either way. That's true. I think I see a raised hand. Yes, yeah, sorry, I have a question. So if you have multiple repositories, say you have more than one data set and you uh, push and pull them from Jin, 
would you just be able to do that with this command data that push um, dash dash to gin when you're in the data set locally you want to push or do you have to specify that further so it doesn't get tangled up? So that's, that's indeed worth clarifying. We use data that push dash dash to gin because previously we did data that create sibling dash dash name gin. So what goes after two is the name we've given explicitly ourselves uh, with the dash dash name argument. Uh, okay, so that would be the, gene, the point where you specify it, okay. But it's uh, it's the name of this data that siblings, so I can, this data set siblings. Uh, so I can have three data sets, each of them would have a sibling named gene pointing to a different repository. Or I can use uh, another, uh, another name to, to identify for myself. Um, I'm quickly demonstrating this um, here. So now I've just created a local sibling uh, that lives on the same Jupyter hub. Uh, it's just a directory up. Um, if I go to the root, I can see here this, that's the sibling of my data set. Um, that sibling is still an empty repository, but it is registered in my data set. And now I have two repositories. One is called Jin, the other is called other name because I created it with the dash dash name, uh, other name parameter. And um, if I were to data that push to Jin, then that will actually just like say everything is up to date. There's nothing to publish. And this will have not affected the um, sibling other name. But if I say data let push to uh, other, what did I call it, other name, uh, then that will not affect Jin, but it will um, go and ahead and publish all of the data set contents, uh, history and, and annex contents to that other sibling. Um, so first of all, uh, in case that uh, you click these settings here and, and this uh, little box private is unchecked, um, that means that you have a public repository. Um, I'll uh, just uh, reiterate here because, you know, for some people it might be really relevant to keep the repository private. In case you want to keep the repository private um, without creating it via the interface, but with create sibling gin, um, the uh, command needs the dash dash private flag and that will make the repository private. Sorry for um, forgetting about that, but it might be relevant. So. And the when settings this... we are looking at are now repository settings. It's not the account settings we went yes. before, but the repository settings. Exactly. So, so I'm, I'm placing that. Under my user account in the data set we've just published, and then I go to settings, and this gives me the repository settings. And here I can see that this repository indeed isn't private, but it is public. Now a public repository now has the um, immense um, advantage that you can point anyone anywhere to this repository. You know, you just share that URL and they can claim it. And um, in case that you have an account engine, then you can also just copy uh, the SSH URL um, uh, to, to, to clone it. Um, what we're um, going to do now, I'm just going to quickly um, summarize this uh, little session on publishing and updating data. So what we've seen is, is Jin, it's a free repository hosting service, but what we need to publish on Jin is an account and an SSH key at minimum. If you want to use it from data that from the command line, then you also need to generate a token. But SSH key and token generation are just one-time operations per computer that you use. Um, there's the create sibling gin command, build an integration um, to operate with gin. And gin has an exa part. That means that data let push publishes all data set contents and the history. In the case that you want to keep certain files private, then there are configurations that you can use to make directories of um, specific patterns of file names, specific file types, um, to configure those those files to not be automatically pushed. Um, those are called preferred content configurations. Um, or you can provide data that pushed with specific paths to names that should explicitly 
um, be pushed. But data let push, if you use it like that, it will push everything that it is capable of pushing. Um, on a repository hosting service like Git, it will not even attempt to push annex data. It will only push the Git part whenever it can find um, an annex support, it will push also the annex. What I can do now that my data set is published is actually something that wasn't possible yesterday because the um, data that I have now pushed to um, Jim is available from several registered locations. The availability information was updated in the background. So I can now go ahead and data let drop an image that um, I wasn't able to drop yesterday because that was just uh, added without a remote location. So if I now do data let drop, it will actually drop it. And if I run data let get off this file again, I can retrieve it. Uh, in this case, I used it from the other name repository, so the other sibling. Um, but if you were to run this locally now, it would retrieve it from Jin. So this is how you use a sibling as your private backup. Um, so yeah, once you have that data set up there, it can be cloned by others. If it's public, it doesn't require a Jin account. And so in the case that you know you already have a lab GitHub account, um, and this is typically where you publish all of your data sets uh, or your code and stuff, um, and you don't really uh, want to use Jin or you are a little bit reluctant because it's known by nobody uh, and uh, how will people find it. Um, one thing that you can do, and there's also a walkthrough how to do this in the handbook, is to have several uh, siblings, one on GitHub, one on Jin, and then you can automatically configure the siblings on GitHub to know about Jin so that the data let get that any uh, of the consumers of your data set uh, run will retrieve the data from the archive on Jin, for example, so that you have the best of both worlds. You have the exposure uh, of your lab's GitHub account um, and you have the um, proper archival DOI association and um, data storage uh, that Jin provides. <clears throat> 